Testing one, two, three. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, About Islam, for having me today. My name is Kareem Sirajuddin. I'm the founder of Nude Human Consulting and the Coffee with Cream podcast. And today I'd like to share with everybody five gems or lessons that I feel like everyone should take away from Ramadan. Uh, it's certainly something that I've learned over the years, and I'd love to share those lessons with you today. Bismillah. Just make sure the sound and everybody can hear and see me. Can I get a confirmation, please, from the admin? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the first big gem or lesson that we should take from Ramadan and what it's supposed to teach us is that you are a spiritual being in essence. You are a spiritual being in essence. In other words, you are not a human being having a spiritual experience, but you're actually a spiritual being having a human experience. And what's my proof for this? Well, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that He created us. Um, we existed before we came into this world. Right? Allah says we He took all the descendants of Adam. We were in a spiritual form, Alastu bi Rabbikum and so on with the ayah, where we would bear bore witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship. And Allah asked us, said, Am I not your Lord? We all said, Yes, you are. And Allah said, Okay, so no one's gonna come on the day of judgment and say, We don't know what you're talking about. Right? So Allah's reminding us that you are spiritual beings in essence. And Ramadan is a month where we put our spiritual nourishment on the forefront and so we realize that what we're really made of isn't just the physical body but we are this union of the spiritual of the metaphysical and the physical right so that's the first big gem that we get from the month of ramadan uh, because it is um it is the month that teaches all of us that there is more to us than just our bodies and our needs of the body. Furthermore, when we are engaging with the Qur'an, inshallah, in Ramadan, we're learning about stories of the Anbiya and the Prophets. Why would God have these stories in the Qur'an? Well, because there's a lot of important lessons for us. And one thing that people don't always get right is that they think that the Prophets were perfect human beings. But they weren't perfect human beings. They, they made mistakes. Okay, and I'm not that that's not the same as sinning. Committing a sin is when you do something against the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it's an act that is punishable according to Allah's law. A mistake is not. A mistake is just you did something suboptimal or not so good, right? So um, you know, this is something we see with the Anbiya. Musa alayhi salam, he kept getting impatient with Khidr, right? That was something suboptimal that he did. And we learn about that story. Yunus السلام, also got impatient with his mission and decided to punch out early and leave the people before Allah told him to leave. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him through the story that we know with, with the whale and coming back to his people and so on and so forth. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you know, he was feeling stressed and anxious about dealing with this chief guy versus this other guy and Allah corrected him and so on and so forth. So, the prophets weren't perfect human beings, but they were the, the best examples of humankind. And not only that, but we learn also in Ramadan, when you engage with these stories in the Book of Allah, is that what made them superior human beings was not that they did not feel tired or get stressed or be impatient or worry or be anxious. SubhanAllah, they felt all these things. They cried, they got sad. Right? It was the fact that they taught us and showed us how to harness the spiritual power within us to get through the tough challenges of life, the existential hurdles that we all have to go through. The prophets and their wives and their families are examples for us to show us here's how you get through the tough times of life. Right? 
you're going to sometimes deal with difficulties. You may be sick. Somebody you love might die. You may struggle with finances. You may struggle with this or getting married or what have you. Right? But all of the prophets had stuff they struggled with. Nobody had it easy from the NBA when you look at their stories. Right? It wasn't a cakewalk. So that's the first big gem that we take from Ramadan. We are spiritual beings having a human experience, not human beings having a spiritual experience. And that what makes us strong and grow and thrive as humans is our spiritual power and reality that helps us get through the existential challenges and difficulties of life that's inevitable for all of us to face. Okay? So don't think that if my life is tough, it means Allah doesn't like me and I'm being punished and this and that. Again, the prophets, Allah loved them more than anybody else and all of their lives were difficult to a degree, right? Some more than others. So that's number one. Number two, one thing we also learn about the science of human nature in Ramadan is that through extreme deprivation or deep deprivation, let's say, of the body, you bring out the opposite force and reality of the spirit. So by depriving the body of all the things that the body needs and loves and wants and yearns for, sleep, sex, food, water, caffeine, right? Whatever it is that we miss. Uh, coffee with Cream podcast. I mean, come on, guys. You know I love coffee. So it's definitely one of the things I miss. Um when you go through fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also showing us when you have a deep discipline for something, especially when it comes to your body, you are going to bring out now the reserves and the force of the spirit to take over. Now, this is very interesting because you got to think about this. So many of us are exhausted in Ramadan, right? It just catches up to us. And yet, subhanAllah, many of us are still able to do, you know, so much ibadah and this and that and you know go out and feed the poor and read quran and pray and help a neighbor and all this good stuff okay where is all that coming from if you have very little actual calories and energy that you get subhanallah where is that spirit coming from and this is we see this in our language all the time right man that kid has spirit you know or like if you've ever seen like you know a karate movie or a scene where there's a fight you know, if somebody gets really beaten down hard and it's like, wow, this guy is over. You just keep telling him, man, just stay down, you know. If you know what's best for you, just stay down. And the person is just broken and they're still getting back up to keep going, right? You know those you know those scenes. That's like, a, you know, an example just shows you like, wow, the body is broken. But the person's still able to get back up. He's still able to fight another round. Or she's still able to go further and jog run and this and that and do more. Where does that come from? It's the spirit, it's the will, it's that power and that force that comes from your essence, which is not necessarily your body. The body is the container for your spirit. So the second lesson is Ramadan teaches us that when we deprive, when we discipline the needs of the body and the nafs, we are able to bring out more clearly the force, the power, and the might of the spirit, which is directly connected and getting sourced to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're getting not energy from food and calories, you're getting energy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one of the things that, inshallah, we can reflect on and take away this Ramadan. Number three, the other thing, Ramadan is a constant trigger to snap you back into the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the other benefit of Ramadan. It's a constant trigger day to day when you're fasting to snap you back into the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Allah says in the Quran that He prescribed fasting for us to enhance in taqwa. Consciousness, presence, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we do that? The best way to do it is you have this constant physical reminder, right? Because it's now an obligation on you to fast. If I want to drink, I want to have my coffee, I'm about to eat, I'm about to do, <coughs> excuse me, oh, in Nisayim, I remember I'm fasting. Why am I fasting? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me wherever I am. And He sees what I do and what I say and what I think. And I can't, I can fool the people if I want to break fast, but Allah knows if you're fasting or not. That's the other thing about this, this ibadah, is it's very, very private and secretive. Because 
come on, let's face it, guys. All of us can pull off not fasting if we really wanted to. Kids that go to school can eat when they're at school and come home and pretend like they're fasting. Husbands and wives, someone goes to work, the other's at home or both go to work. You can have coffee and a bagel in the morning. I'll just have a breakfast, but I'll fast the rest of the day. So by the time I get home, I'm still tired and I get some of that Ramadan breath. So people think I'm fasting, you know. But Allah knows exactly what you're doing and who you are and where you go and what you eat. So it also enhances your certainty, which is your in, and presence and, and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is taqwa, right? Taqwa is about that connection and awareness and shield of having the presence of God in your life. It helps you check yourself before you wreck yourself. So there is an element of, of course, fear and being cautious of what you do and why you do what you do. And there's also the pleasant joy of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you. And all I have to do is engage and focus my intention and my presence and thoughts with Allah, and I'm with Him. Because He's already with me. So if I feel far from God, that's because of me. I'm the one who's in the long distance here, not Allah. Allah's already with you and closer to you than your jug of their vein, as He says in the Quran. So, Ramadan is this powerful time that every year it's a way that Allah forces the believers to recondition dhikr of Allah, remembrance of Allah, connection with Allah, whether you like it or not. Well, fasting is going to do that for you. It's going to put you in that zone. Because why am I tired? Why am I praying? Why is there taraweeh? What is iftar? All of these things, it reminds us of the ultimate purpose and the center of our world and existence, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the point of fasting. It's not to torture you. It's not to punish you. It's not to make you feel like um, our, our religion is so you know tough and uh, why can't I be Buddhist or whatever. You know, It's really about bringing out this inner power that you have, spiritual power that you have that Allah um, told us is real and it's something very special that it comes from Him. Number four, Ramadan revives and teaches us how to be giving and forgiving. Through the shared experience of all of us feeling our human fragility, right? When we're fasting Ramadan, we realize, subhanAllah, we're really weak creatures. We're not all that. That's why it's absurd for a human being to be arrogant and think they're so mighty and grand. Two minutes without oxygen, you're dead. Of eight hours, 12 hours, 18 hours without food and water, half of us are collapsing and we can't even sit up straight and, and keep our eyes open. You're not that strong. You know, remember that. Be humble. Ramadan teaches you that you're a fragile creature. You are a creature in need. You're contingent. And this is why in the Fatiha we say, means we worship, we adore, we serve you alone, Ya Allah. And it implies that we need you, obviously. If someone is your master and your owner, you need that person or you need that authority. But then this following verse, you say, which is reconfirmation that, Ya Allah, we really need you and depend on you. Like we're nothing without you. And it's true. There is no thing that is real or ever will live or exist without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the bottom line. So Ramadan reminds us how fragile we are, how weak we are. And inshallah, it also helps us want to forgive each other. Because we realize like, wow, we're all uncomfortable here. We all can suffer. We all have pain. We all have hurt. We're all fragile and delicate. And all of us will tremble when we die. We will tremble in fear when we die. In fear that Allah won't forgive us. Right? We worry about that. And hopes that He will. Everyone's going to feel that way. You see? When it comes down to it. That person that you still talk trash about or that person that you resent because of what they did three years ago in front of your friends. You know, when in 50 years, 100 years, we're all going to be dead. We're all going to be gone. So what are we really going to do with remembering our fragility and that we are not going to last forever? Be humble. Be forgiving. Uh, recognize that forgiveness is one of the greatest charities that you can give to others and to yourself. Because resentment is just a poison that you keep drinking and the other person doesn't get affected. So Ramadan reminds us that life is short. We're all weak. We're in this together as human beings, as a creation. And subhanAllah, inshallah, sadaqah is made easier on us. When we are deprived and not giving ourselves everything the nafs wants all day, 
we also find ourselves it's much easier for us to give others, right? Because I myself, I'm not eating as much as I usually do. I'm not sleeping as much as I usually do. So it's easier for me to spend and give to others because I don't, my nafs isn't bloated, right? You know, those times when you're just, you're overeating, you're overspending. Those are usually the times when you're the weakest to give sadaqah, right? Unless you're feeling really guilty. You're like, man, I just spent a thousand dollars on my purse. I better go give $20 to purify tezgiyah, my, my wealth here, because I'm just, you know, consuming for luxury here, right? In Ramadan, it opens up our hearts as well to sadaqah, forgiveness and giving because of this fragility and deprivation that we put ourselves through. But in it comes the elevation of connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enhancing our heart and the core of what we are meant to be and who we are, which is virtuous virtuous and proper representatives of the divine reality and number five the last point or gem that i want to share is ramadan at least for me is like this crazy time zone work every year i don't know about you guys but every year i'm like i can't believe it's ramadan already you guys feel the same way i'm sure like we're about to celebrate Eid inshallah and I like as soon as you're done your Eid cookies like a few weeks going to go by and you're already going someone's already going to tell you oh dude Ramadan's in like 30 days like just like that like it goes by so fast this is another powerful insight and gem Allah reminds us through this critical time of the year every year right and you may feel this for other things too but I don't know for some reason I feel like Ramadan just strikes you more seriously than like New Year's or your birthday or whatever. It's like when Ramadan's coming again, you're like, wow, because we all know what that's about. And it's like a thing that you get into for 30 days. It's not just like a one day thing like, oh, it's my birthday. It's like 30 days you're immersed in this experience. So it's a big deal when it's coming again. And it's a big deal when it's ending. I feel like every year it comes, it comes faster. The years go by faster. Life is ticking, ladies and gentlemen. And your life is measured by breaths, okay? Not years. You're not guaranteed to live till you're 100 or 50 or this or that. Nobody knows when you're taking the flight out of here. Well, just because you know when you were born doesn't mean you know when you're leaving. So this is a reminder for us, right? That time is going by very fast. And we have to focus on what really matters in our lives, in our relationships, and how we spend our time. And every year when Ramadan comes, you pass one more checkpoint towards your death. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you and me another opportunity. Hey, recalibrate. You've been pretty messy and rocky all year. Recalibrate with me and the book that I have sent to humankind as a guidance. Allah is giving us an opportunity to reboot every year. right? To correct ourselves, purify ourselves. Get more forgiveness because maybe the year after this Ramadan, I'm going to go out or you're going to go out. We don't know. So we have this month to inshallah wash and cleanse our souls from all the dust and all the crust and all the filth that we may have put onto it, stuck onto it. Or other people stuck it on to us and we never pulled it off ourselves. These are all the benefits of Ramadan as well. So the fifth one is this you know, big reminder of how fast time is going by, how we need to take advantage of Ramadan every time it does come, because it's literally an opportunity for Allah to forgive you, to heal you, to guide you, and to accept you. And lastly, Ramadan is the time where we don't want to just finish it and go, Alhamdulillah, I prayed every tarawih, Alhamdulillah, I read the whole Quran, Alhamdulillah, I did this, I did that. That's great. And I hope also you know what you're learning when you read Qur'an or memorize more Qur'an, you have to know the meaning, not just memorize and recite. You might as well recite you know, Mandarin if you don't know what you're saying. You should know the, the words and the meaning of the Qur'an if you're really going to have a relationship with the messages. right? If, you have, if you're in love with a person that you don't speak their language, right? you're at a school or a cafe and you fall in love with somebody, you're like, I want to learn that language. That's a very common thing. right? Oh my God, you're Spanish? I want to speak Spanish. Because I want to know what you're saying. And then we learn the language and we realize they're saying all the same junk we're saying in English or Arabic or Hindi or whatever we speak. Oh, what laundry and the bus stop. and It's all the same stuff, right? But Allah's words are different. Because His speech is not the everyday mundane stuff. Most of us, we, you know, 
spend our time speaking about things that isn't really valuable in the end of the day and you measure it in the big picture. It's not. Okay? So we have to know the meaning of the Quran and that's one of the best ways to make the most of your time outside of Ramadan in Ramadan. But besides just being happy with the quantifiable acts of worship that you may have accomplished and may Allah accept it and multiply it infinitely for each and every one of you who have done so, is we should also ask at the end of Ramadan, how have I changed? What character traits have I identified in myself that were flawed, ugly, imperfect, needed to be polished? Because I'll tell you right now, if you're not a person who thinks that from time to time, then you're in a delusion of yourself. You're either self-righteous, narcissistic, arrogant, you know, you just, there's nothing wrong with me. It's like, no, there is. There's always something wrong with you, by the way, and myself. And so Ramadan is also a time for us to actually learn more about who we are, right? Not just what we can do and how many prayers we do and how many iftars we host and how many things we go to, but who are you? That's something you're supposed to take because in Ramadan, your nafs really shows up, doesn't it? It really shows its face clearly. There's no shayateen to call you to evil and this and that. So any garbage in your character that comes out in Ramadan, that's on you. That's you now. That's imprinted in yourself in Ramadan. So Ramadan also teaches us, wow, turns out I'm like really bad at backbiting. I'm like addicted to social media. Turns out I have anger issues. Turns out, you know, I am addicted to pornography. Like really, because I'm watching this stuff in porn. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things in Ramadan that they shouldn't be. And there's no shayateen to blame. You can't play that card. Oh, shaitan made me, he whispered. No, no. Even if he whispered, you're still choosing to do, by the way. It's never shaitan's fault, right? So in Ramadan, you also learn who you really are. And after, and during and after Ramadan, you should also think about that and think about, wow, how can I change the stuff I learned about myself or others saw in me and reflected in me? This is very important because, wallahi, Without akhlaq and adab, I don't know how effective your practice of Islam will ever be for yourself or others. Because the early Muslims, they didn't spread Islam by being intellectual, philosophical, and oh, they're such great speakers and going and giving great talks. That wasn't who they were. They were manawareen. They had nur in their face and their light because of their iman, their intentions, their sincerity, and their akhlaq. That's what made people be like, who are you? What are you upon? What kind of person are you? And I know this from converts, for example, that I know. They become Muslim, you know, and they have some of these stories where like, yeah, bro, my aunt and my cousins, they all became Muslim. I'm like, subhanAllah, how did they become Muslim? You know, they didn't hand out books and give them a course. They said they became Muslim because they saw how I changed. They saw that I didn't cuss. They saw I don't do drugs anymore. They saw that I serve my family. They saw that I... I think more wisely, right? I have good akhlaq. That's, they said, subhanAllah, what is this guy on? What is this Islam about? They saw the nur, right? This is something we want in us when we come out of Ramadan. Not just, oh, thank God it's over. Now I'm going to go binge on sugar and binge on social media and binge on movies again. And it all goes down the drain, right? SubhanAllah. So this is the last thing. And it's connected to my fifth point, which was very long. The time point. Time is ticking and going by fast. Ramadan's a reminder of how fast your life is going by. And I'll tell you guys, those of you who are young, it only gets faster as you get older. It doesn't slow down. Okay? Three is make the most of your time <clears throat> and uh, take away not just the acts of worship that you've done, but how those acts of worship, how those insights and realizations during Ramadan can actually teach you something about your flaws and your character. Because the highest station in Islam is to be muhsin, muhsina. And that means you are a person who's actively in pursuit of what? Excellence and beautification of your inside, of your consciousness, of your character, of your heart, of your, of your conduct. This is what muhsin is. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? You can't be a muhsin or muhsina if you think you're perfect and there's no more you know, edges to soothe or things to heal or parts of myself to correct or clean. You're, you can't be muhsina or muhsin. So it, it suggests to us, 
if the path of ihsan to be muhsan is constant, and it is, then that means there's always stuff in you and me that's going to be flawed, suboptimal, is ugly, is dirty, needs to be clear, clean, healed, grown, etc., etc., etc. We have to mature more. That's the case. And anyone who thinks otherwise, they're living in a delusion. And may Allah help them see the light because nobody's perfect except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're never going to be a perfect human being. Even the prophets of Allah who are better than all of us, they weren't perfect. So let's stop with the, you know, that race to nowhere. You know, this race to be perfect all the time. You're never going to be perfect. But pursue excellence as much as you can. How can I be a better me tomorrow than I am today? How am I better today than I was last week, last year, last Ramadan? These are questions I invite everybody to ask themselves, inshallah, at the end of Ramadan and during Ramadan. And don't be just satisfied with, you know, a lot of worship acts um, alone, especially if you don't know what you're saying or doing half the time. It's just more of a mechanical thing. But make the most of your worship by understanding the meaning of what you do and why you do it, whether it's Quran or Salah. And second step is take the meaning and what you do and ask, how can I apply this to me? I learned this about Musa and Khidr. I learned this about the Prophet. I learned this about that. Allah says this and uses that. And How does this apply to me? How do I work with that in my life? Because if the Quran is really for all people in all times, then it's going to have guidance and knowledge and insight for all people in all times and all places. If it's not, then you're probably not harnessing the Quran properly. And you're certainly not harnessing the Quran properly if you're following an interpretation or somebody's ideas from 500 or 1,000 years ago that are not really relevant to the context that you're in. Because the Quran is not a static book, ladies and gentlemen. Quran is kalam Allah. It's the speech of God. And God is al hayul qayyum He is the eternal, the everlasting. So His words are alive. I don't know if you guys have ever thought about that. His words in the Quran are alive. It's not static. It's not, oh, that's it. That's just the meaning. That's it. Closed, sealed, deal. No. Allah's words will be able to speak to generations and all kinds of people and different cultures and politics and different situations until the end of time. That's the Quran. That's what we possess in our heritage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us, you know, worthy servants and, you know, accept our efforts uh, and our fragility and give us strength and power and forgive us our sins and give us the best in this life and the next. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, bless everybody um, who is supporting about Islam and the people who come and attend these talks. May Allah increase all of you for trying to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have a few minutes. If anyone had a question or two, um, please write it as fast as you can on the uh, comment section, and I will address it if I can. Stuff for one. All right. Okay, I take it that there's no questions for now. Thank you all for listening. And if I made any mistakes, it's from myself. And if you got any benefit or aha moments, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has teaches you directly when you have taqwa of him. So just to reiterate the five points before we end, the five gems or points that I shared. Number one, your spiritual beings having a human experience, not human beings having a spiritual experience. Your spirit is your essence. And the prophets, why Allah teaches us their stories is to show us not that they're perfect human beings, but that they are spiritual beings going through the human experiences that they're going through. They had tough times. But what made them special and raised in their station is they harnessed their spiritual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get through the tough things. Okay? Point two is that through deprivation and discipline of the body, Allah teaches us 
that this is how the soul and the spirit steps forward when we put the needs of the body back and we tell it to be quiet. We say, shh, nothing for you right now. This is about Allah. No extra sleep, no extra food. You're not going to get what you want. The nafs wants what it wants. And, and inshallah, another talk, we'll talk about the nafs. But the nafs wants what it wants. So the, Ramadan is about putting that nafs back in its place and putting it back in that cage so that you, the higher self, can become the the king and queen of your castle again. Not the not the nafs. Don't let the nafs run wild. It's kind of like if you have a pet dog, you know, there's a dog that's, you know, graceful and clean and disciplined and it follows orders, it barks when it when you tell it to, it's quiet when you tell it to, it sits when you tell it to, it eats only what you give it, it doesn't ask for more, it doesn't scratch the furniture. That's a good animal, a good pet, good 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 dog, right? When you let the nafs do whatever it wants and keep feeding it and giving that lower self of yours everything it wants, you have a very chaotic, destructive, strong growling dog that's running all over the place and causing chaos. Try to grab him by the leash, he's just pulling you around. You have no control. But we'll save that for another talk. So two is, the body's deprivation increases and makes us realize who the true king and queen of our inner castle is. It's the soul. It's the heart. It's the relationship with Allah. That's what truly gives you power and, and elevation in your existence. Number three, Ramadan is a constant trigger day to day through the fast to remind you and snap you back into remembrance and taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, it also teaches us our fragility and our weakness as human beings and that we need each other. You know, we have iftar together, we celebrate, we enjoy, we have the joy, we share the resources. This is a reminder that we are a people of one family. We're one, we come from one set of parents. We're here to share the joy together, share the resources, share, share the barakah. It also teaches us to be more forgiving and giving. Because when we have less, when we experience less, we also know what that's like. And it makes it easier for us to give when we're actually depriving ourselves or being more strict with ourselves and not overly luxurious and indulgent. And this is why, you, wallahi, you taste the sweetness of Ramadan even more when you don't overeat in Ramadan. So if you gained weight by the end of Ramadan, unless you have a genetic or medical issue, I have news for you. You didn't do it right. You're not supposed to gain weight in Ramadan. Okay? That means you overdid it. So next year, inshallah, you keep that in mind. Sadaqah is easier to give in Ramadan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallam, remind us of the merit of giving sadaqah, especially in Ramadan. And lastly, the time. Time is ticking and going by. Life is short. Refine your qualities. Focus on what matters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. And thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.